Welcome to the Economist in Your Ear podcast. Have you ever stopped to think about how much of the information we rely on, especially in critical areas like science and medicine, is truly unreservedly reliable? What if the very system designed to ensure accuracy and integrity is being subtly yet dramatically compromised from within? It's an unsettling thought, isn't it? Today, we're going to pull back the curtain on a truly fascinating and frankly quite alarming problem, the booming, almost runaway prevalence of fraudulent scientific papers. We'll unpack a recent article that sheds a harsh light on this issue, and then we'll go beyond the headlines to reveal some surprising angles, hidden complexities, and why this isn't just an academic curiosity, but something with very real consequences for all of us. Absolutely. We're looking at what one study described as a massive and rapidly growing problem with some very serious downstream implications. This isn't just about flawed data or obscure academic journals. It's about potentially compromised medical guidance, misallocated research funds, and, well, a fundamental erosion of trust in the very foundation of scientific knowledge. It's really a challenge to the integrity of knowledge itself. So let's kick off with a statistic that just uh, stopped me in my tracks. A paper published in PNAS, that's the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, a highly respected journal, shared something truly astonishing. While the number of scientific articles generally doubles every 15 years, the number of fraudulent ones has been doubling every 1.5 years since 2010, 10 times faster. What does that kind of exponential growth even mean for the future of scientific research? It means we're in a critical moment. Seriously. The senior author of that PNAS study, Luis Nunez Amaral, didn't mince words. He warned that if nothing is done, the scientific enterprise in its current form would be destroyed. That's a stark forecast, and it speaks to the sheer scale of the problem. This isn't just about a few rogue individuals, you know. Right. So if it's not just isolated bad actors, what are we talking about here? The study suggests something far more organized, right? <laughs> exactly. The PNAS study points to something much more sinister, scalable networks, often referred to as paper mills. Imagine sophisticated operations creating fake research papers, sometimes using AI to generate plausible sounding data and text, and then selling authorship on these fabricated works to academics. Selling authorship? Yes, selling authorship to academics who are often desperate to boost their publication numbers for career advancement. It's an entire industry built on deception. Wow. And what's particularly compelling about the PNAS study is how they managed to uncover some of this by drilling down into a specific journal, PLOS1. Why PLS1? Well, PLOS1 is unusually transparent. Unlike many journals that keep editor identities private, PLOS1 publicly tags each paper to its handling editor. This transparency, while laudable in itself, inadvertently created a data goldmine for these researchers. It allowed them to identify a concentrated group of about 45 editors who were tied to a disproportionate share of later retracted or publicly flagged papers. Okay, and when you say disproportionate share, what are we talking about specifically? What did the numbers reveal? To be precise, these 45 editors, despite handling only a tiny fraction, about 1.3% of PLOS1 submissions, they were responsible for over 30% of all the retracted articles. 30%? from just 1.3% of the workload. Exactly. This isn't random chance. It's a clear signal of concentrated vulnerabilities within the editorial process itself, almost like a hot spot of, well, questionable activity. That certainly suggests a coordinated effort, or at least a significant vulnerability, but it gets even more concerning, I read. It does. The data showed that more than half of these particular editors had themselves authored papers later retracted by PLOS1. Oh, wow. And here's the kicker. They regularly suggested each other as editors for their own submissions. So a kind of closed loop. A bit too cozy. It certainly paints a picture, doesn't it? Like a closed, self-referential loop where people are looking out for each other and maybe not necessarily for the integrity of the science. So does the PNAS study prove they were all dishonest? Well, the analysis itself doesn't offer conclusive proof of dishonest intent for every single case. But Nature Magazine, using the study's approach, went a step further and actually named several of these editors. And PLOS 1 then confirmed that these individuals were investigated and ultimately dismissed between 2020 and 2022. Uh -huh. So while this highlights a concentrated problem that was definitely happening, it also shows that action was indeed taken by the journal once these patterns became clear. It's a real-world consequence, not just a theoretical one. Okay. That initial picture is disturbing enough. Really paints a picture of vulnerability. Mm -hmm. But as we pull back another layer you mentioned earlier, the problem isn't just deeper. It might be far more insidious and widespread than just one journal or a few compromised editors. Mm. What are some of the crucial nuances that maybe challenge that initial framing a bit? Precisely. 
For instance, the idea that editors are partly responsible is true, and the PNAS study brilliantly spotlights that specific vulnerability at PLOS 1. However, the problem isn't confined to a few bad apples there. A 2024 science investigation found evidence of paper mills actually bribing editors and seeding editorial boards across multiple publishers. Bribing editors? Seriously? Yes. It suggests a much wider, more deeply rooted ecosystem fueled by direct cash incentives, loopholes in special issue publications, and alarmingly weak controls over guest editors. It's not an isolated issue. It's looking more like a systemic vulnerability across the publishing landscape. So it's not just a PLOS one specific issue. It's a vulnerability that paper mills are exploiting across the board like a, I don't know, a virus finding weak points. And speaking of specific journals, does the transparency of PLOS 1 also skew how we perceive the problem? Because, you know, if they're the only ones really showing their cards, it might look like they have a bigger problem, even if others are just as bad but less visible. Absolutely. That's a key point. The study's sharpest, most detailed editor-level signals come from PLOS 1 because it's unusually transparent about who handled what. Many other journals simply don't publish editor identities. So the visible concentration at one venue could partly reflect what we call measurement asymmetry. We're seeing it clearly there because we can. Not necessarily because it's uniquely worse. Exactly. It might not be uniquely worse than other places where the data is hidden. The broader cross-publisher trend of fraud still looks ugly, don't get me wrong, even if the individual editor data is less visible elsewhere. It really underscores just how important transparency is for detection, doesn't it? It really does. And what about that headline-grabbing number fraud doubling every 1.5 years? That's terrifying. But is it just a pure, explosive growth in new fraudulent papers being created? Or is there more to that statistic? Does it tell the whole story? That rate likely blends genuine growth in fraud with a crucial positive development. Better detection and reporting? Think about advancements in image forensics for spotting manipulated images. Think about the increased vigilance of online communities like PubPeer, where researchers publicly review and critique papers after publication. Right, the post-publication peer review. Yes, and also large-scale publisher cleanups. For example, we've seen a major publisher like Wiley retract literally thousands of papers recently. They even shut down entire journals because they were found to be riddled with fraudulent content from paper mills. Thousands, wow. Yeah. These mass cleanups, while absolutely necessary, they can inflate near-term retraction counts. So while the problem is undeniably real and serious, that doubling number also reflects improved vigilance and a much more active cleanup effort, which is, in its own way, a sign of progress or at least recognition of the problem. It means we're getting better at finding it, not just that it's growing uncontrolled. Okay, so while better detection offers a glimmer of hope, it still highlights a colossal cleanup job ahead. But the big question for you, our listener, isn't just about academia or journal statistics. It's about the real world. What's the actual fallout from this compromised research? Is it truly affecting people outside of the ivory tower? This is where it gets really important for all of us, because the downstream harm is absolutely not hypothetical. In medicine especially, the risk isn't just embarrassment for researchers or a messy database. It's the distortion of clinical guidance that impacts patient care. How so? Can you give an example? Well, recent work in the BMJ, a leading medical journal, found that a significant portion, something like 8 to 16 percent of conclusions in systematic reviews, these are studies that synthesize evidence from multiple trials. Those conclusions ended up being wrong if they included trials that were later retracted. 8 to 16 percent wrong. That's a huge margin of error when it comes to medical advice. It is, exactly. And what's truly alarming is that those compromised reviews then fed into 157 official medical guideline documents. Official guidelines, hmm. like the ones doctors use. Precisely. Think about it. This isn't just about obscure academic papers anymore. It means potentially flawed medical advice for, say, a new cancer treatment or incorrect dietary guidelines affecting millions. The integrity of our health literally hangs in the balance. It's a direct clinical risk pipeline affecting patient care, not just some mess in the literature. It's a really stark reminder that compromised science can have very tangible and dangerous consequences for public health. That's sobering. Yeah. It sounds like a deeply complex problem then driven by more than just a few bad editors or even just the paper mills themselves, what are the deeper systemic incentives that are fueling this boom in fraudulent papers? 
it feels like there are powerful forces at play pushing people towards these activities. It's definitely a multifaceted issue, truly a perfect storm of misaligned incentives, you could say. On one side, you have publishers, especially those using article processing charges or APCs. Those are the fees authors pay to get published. Right. Fees authors pay, essentially turning publication into a direct revenue stream for the publisher. Or they use special issue models. These models mean publishers can, potentially, earn more money per accepted paper. Paper mills specifically target these models because they represent a direct, lucrative revenue stream. If a publisher earns more by accepting more papers and the quality control is maybe a bit weak, especially in, say, rapidly produced special issues, well, it creates a dangerous, almost irresistible incentive to perhaps overlook problems. Okay, so it's not just about disseminating knowledge, but how it's paid for can create perverse incentives. And then there's the pressure on the researchers themselves, right? We often hear about publish or perish. Is that playing a big role? Precisely. Then there are the researchers. They face intense, almost suffocating pressure. Pressure for getting hired, for promotion, for securing critical funding. Their careers are often judged, maybe too heavily, by metrics obsessed with raw publication counts and citation numbers. Just counting papers, basically. Yeah, it can feel like that. It's an academic version of a pressure cooker. And paper mills capitalize on this immense demand by selling authorship as a service, allowing academics to boost their numbers quickly and easily, sometimes without doing the actual research. That's the demand side that makes the mills boom. It's offering a solution, albeit a deeply misguided one, to a real problem for academics under pressure. It's an unholy alliance, in a way, between the supply from the mills and the demand from stressed researchers. So researchers are under intense pressure. Publishers can potentially profit from volume. But what about the gatekeepers, like the massive databases that track reputable journals and their impact? Companies like Clarivate with Web of Mayans, are they playing a role in combating this, or are they inadvertently part of the problem by creating those metrics everyone chases? Yes, and this is actually a positive development, or at least a potentially powerful lever. Indexers like Web of Science and Clarivate, which are crucial for defining a journal's reputation and reach, are starting to tighten their levers. They now exclude retracted content from their journal impact factor calculations, that key metric of a journal's prestige and influence. Ah, so retracted papers don't count towards the score anymore. Right. And furthermore, they can even delist entire journals from their index until they clean house. This shifts incentives squarely towards active integrity work by publishers. If a journal's reputation, its impact factor, its very inclusion in these key databases, and therefore its financial viability, are directly tied to its integrity. It creates a powerful tool to push for change and force publishers to take a much more proactive stance against fraud. It's starting to make fraud economically painful for publishers. Okay, that does sound like a positive step. Making integrity pay, or at least making fraud costly. But this whole situation sounds daunting overall. So if we connect this to the bigger picture, what are some practical, actionable solutions beyond just saying everyone needs to be more vigilant, which is true, but maybe not enough? What can actually be done to stem this tide and restore trust? Yeah, we need concrete steps. First, we need to make editor identity and their specific actions auditable across all journals. Just like PLS 1's transparency-enabled detection in that study, lack of such data elsewhere creates a major measurement blind spot. We simply can't fix what we can't see or measure effectively. Transparency really has to be foundational to accountability and, ultimately, to restoring integrity. So shine a light on the whole process everywhere. Makes sense. What else can be done to really clamp down on the conduits these paper mills are using so effectively? Second, we need to throttle the riskiest conduits. That means seriously tightening and probably capping special issue and guest editor pipelines. These have proven to be major vectors for fraudulent papers, often bypassing the standard editorial checks. This requires things like strict conflict of interest disclosures, regular editor rotation to prevent those cozy closed loops we talked about, and centrally controlled quality oversight for reviewer invitations, not leaving it all to guest editors who might be compromised. The fact that publishers are now closing down entire compromised special issues clearly shows why this matters. These specific channels have become dangerously easy entry points for fraud. Right. Close those loopholes. And for the medical side, where the real world harm is so direct and immediate, what specific measures can be taken there to protect patients and ensure that clinical decisions are based on sound, reliable research? We absolutely need to harden medical guidelines and systematic reviews. That system needs to be more robust. This means requiring living systematic reviews. 
These are reviews that are constantly updated as new evidence emerges. They need to automatically flag retractions from services like Crossref or Retraction Watch, which are databases that track published and retracted papers. So real-time updates when underlying data gets pulled. Exactly. And when an included trial is pulled, conclusions based on that review must be immediately reassessed and potentially reissued. The BMJ findings on wrong conclusions ending up in official medical guidelines make this non-optional, really. We simply cannot afford to have clinical decisions based on flawed data, especially when the corrections are available and detectable. It needs to be dynamic. That seems critical. Mm -hmm. And finally, addressing those core incentives you mentioned earlier, the publish or perish culture and the financial models of journals. What changes are needed at that fundamental systemic level? Because that seems like the root cause. Yes. Fundamentally, funders and universities need to reform their incentives. That's the big one. They should actively de-emphasize raw publication counts in hiring and promotion decisions and move towards quality-weighted assessments, looking at the actual impact and rigor of the work, not just the number of lines on a CV. Essentially, extending the logic that indexers are already applying to retracted citations quality over quantity. If academic success isn't solely about the sheer number of papers, but the quality, rigor, and integrity of those papers, it removes a major, almost irresistible driver for researchers to even consider engaging with paper mills. It shifts the entire focus from quantity to genuine contribution. So bringing all this together, there's a complex picture. What's the critical takeaway for you, our listener, as you navigate this flood of information and try to discern what's truly reliable? While the original article was absolutely right to spotlight editorial complicity as a key vulnerability, that PNAS study was insightful. But what's fascinating here, as we've discussed, is that the bigger story is truly structural. The complex economics of paper mills, publisher revenue models that sometimes incentivize volume over quality, opaque workflows hiding editorial actions, and those deeply misaligned academic incentives, these all converge to create a system where even a few compromised editors can do outsized damage and where fraud can flourish in an alarming rate. It's a complex web, you know, not a simple case of a few villains. Right. But the good news, though, is that the tools and levers to combat this problem actually exist or are emerging. We have examples of better editor transparency models. We have powerful indexer policies that are starting to force publishers to clean house. We're seeing large-scale publisher cleanups already in progress, even if they inflate the numbers temporarily. And we have the potential for things like living reviews that adapt to new information in real time, especially in medicine. So it's not a hopeless situation, but one where the solutions require coordinated, deliberate effort from all sides. Absolutely. And this raises an important question, maybe the most important one. The real test isn't whether we can solve this, but whether all the stakeholders, publishers, universities, funders, and even individual researchers and readers will actually use these tools effectively and fast enough. Will the fixes outpace the fraud? Can we stop this curve of scientific fraud from outrunning the solutions? It feels like a critical moment for the integrity of knowledge itself and the foundation upon which so much of our progress relies. And perhaps the biggest takeaway for you, our listener, is simply to remember that critical thinking, asking questions about where information comes from, and maintaining a healthy, informed curiosity about the sources behind the claims you encounter are more vital now than ever before. Thank you for joining us for this exploration of scientific integrity.